What's going on YouTube family? Welcome to Automotive Life. My name is Lucky and today we're going to be talking about the automotive loan crisis. How did we get here? What's currently going on in the market? And what do we see coming down the road in 2023? Now in my last video I showed you just a small piece of the pie when we went to the repo yards. We saw the buildup, what's currently going on and how they are taking more and more cars and prepping for the worst. Now we're going to talk about the banks. How did they basically play a role in this? How did the dealerships play a role in this? Also, how the government stuck their hand in the cookie jar and kind of screwed all this up? So we're gonna go over all that. Now, I'm not only gonna give you a, a behind the scenes look as far as a consumer, but as well as a dealer. If you're new to my channel, my name is Lucky. I'm an automotive expert. I've been in the automotive industry for over 20 years. I've owned multiple dealerships, rental car companies, and auto repair shops. And this channel is all about showing you behind the curtains of currently what's going on in the automotive industry. And I think this is a great thing. This is a very hot topic. It's been a while since I made a video. The last seven days have been an absolute roller coaster. One, I hit 100K, so shout out to that. I'm gonna make a separate video for that one. Um, I've been interviewed by multiple news outlets. I'm actually gonna go on a few different news outlets, podcasts, everything else like this, because nobody's really talking about this. And we talked about this about four months ago, and the video popped off. I think it got about 300,000 views and like 4,000 comments. And so now it's being shared on Reddit posts, Twitter, and other financial institutions. And so now it's starting to make its rounds because we're putting you know, part A with part B, a lot of these banks are like, oh, the economy's great, things are great. It is not. And if you look at some of these uh, articles we're gonna talk about today, because not only are we gonna talk about how we got here, but I wanna show some stuff from uh, the commercial, excuse me, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as well as the Fed. They both have documented on their websites, which I'll leave links down below, of how they're worried about the subprime automotive market crashing, how people are $1.5 trillion in debt in automotive loans, and they expect by the end of 2022 to be 1.8 trillion, which is the highest it's ever been in our nation's history. And there's a few reasons why. Now, one of the things that got us in this predicament was LTV, which is loan to value. When we started this, most times, banks will only lend up to about maybe 100, 110% of LTV. So if you buy a new car, you have really good credit and you wanna buy maybe some aftermarket wheels, floor mats, uh, aftermarket warranty to protect yourself, carpet protection, car protection, whatever you wanna add on there, it gives you the ability to add some aftermarket accessories on there and the bank will finance it because you're a good consumer of credit. You actually pay your bills. But what happened was is during the pandemic, the banks use this like, hey, inflation, the cars are going up in value, so we need to be able to go 120, 130, 140% on not only prime, but also subprime loans. So now, people owe more on their cars than ever before. We talked about in the last video how in 2008, the average person was around 80% of LTV, and people were still getting their cars repoed. Fast forward to today, the average is 115% of LTV, and then, like I said, as high as 130% of LTV, which which is absolutely insane to lend that much over a uh, value on a depreciating asset. So, you know, they were able to get away with it because that's the way the current market was and everything else. But one of the really scary things that I saw as a dealer, if you come into my dealership and I get a loan for you and you come in and you're like, hey, Lucky, I just got a new job. I just finished becoming a plumber. And before you were, let's say, a bartender. If you got a certification and now you're a plumber, I can take your income for your future job because that's an actual trade, it's something that you're doing. You Just like if you graduated from school, you became a dentist, an RN, whatever the case is, that's how banks justify giving somebody new a bigger line of credit or a bigger automotive loan. Fast forward to the pandemic, all these stimulus ballers are went from making, let's say, $2,500 a month to now they're making four grand. Well, usually when it's, either a similar job or there's something else, we try to take six months of their previous history into consideration so this way we don't give them too high of a loan they can't afford because this may be a temporary spike like a summer job or something else like that, something seasonal where they make a lot of money and then it goes away. So we traditionally go six months back, average that out and that's the loan we give you. Well, during the pandemic, they just took those rules and regulations and psh, shot them out the door, they decided we're just gonna give everybody loans based off of what they say they make. So if you make $4,000 in government money, then guess what? You're approved for a $1,000 car payment. 
So the nation's average car payment is $600 right now, which is the highest it's ever been. But a lot of the repos that we've been picking up, the average car payment is close to $900 to $1,000, which blows my mind. I've never seen so many people, when well, we're not talking exotic cars or crazy luxury, we're talking like Dodge Chargers, uh, Chevy Malibus, a few Silverados, some Dodge Rams, $1,000 car payments for people that during the pandemic, we're making $2,500 a month, and now maybe that person and their spouse combined are making $8,000, not paying rent, putting 20 grand down, and then uh, um, only paying you know a few months before they default. Now, that's one of the other things that was skewed. During the pandemic, you know, banks got a lot more money down than they traditionally did. So as we work the ratio for your loan, if you show up to our dealership with a big down payment, we're like, okay, this customer is qualified because if you have, you know, let's say a 620 credit score, which is not the greatest, but it's better than most, and you have like, you know, 20% down, 30% down, we're looking at you like, oh, this is a guy that budget, manages budget, does everything correctly, so we're gonna go ahead and, and give him maybe a little bit more of a bigger loan because he saved up the money to get to this. He's responsible. What didn't, nobody, or excuse me, what the banks didn't take into consideration was the fact that none of these people were paying their rent. A lot of them were making, like I said, the $8,000 a month as a couple on stimulus and everything else. And so these people are putting massive down payments. So the skew of the loans, even if it's uh, prime or subprime, is completely skewed because you have people that are putting large down payments that can't afford the monthly payments, and now they're losing their cars. So. As the Fed started basically backing, I feel like every bank and every loan and everything else, people or the banks just started loosening up policies. They started being more relaxed. They're like, let's just go ahead and push the cars out. Let's just get them out. Let's just get them out. And I saw some of the craziest loans ever seen given. I mean, they're just asking people for general information. Like when you ask for proof of income, proof of residency, you know, we want docs, um, home bills, power bills, uh, your gas bill, cable bill, something like that. Some of these loans that we've seen packaged are absolute garbage. And the reason why I wanna kinda of talk about this right now is this is what I see coming in 2023. Now, in 2008, you know, the subprime housing market, whatever else, all these ninja loans, they would bundle this paper together they would rate it as AAA paper and then they would ship it out and sell it on the stock market or they would sell it to another bank. And that's what they did and that's how they made their money. They're doing the same thing with automotive paper, but here's the problem. They're taking this really crappy paper, just like those loans, home loans, they're bundling them up, they're rating them as whatever AA, AAA, whatever else, because I think Moody's just downgraded it to like, I think it was like single A. So they, they basically package this crappy paper, they send it out there, and either these people buy it for their retirement funds, people invest in it, or even worse, these banks keep buying it from each other. And that's where I see the problem. So what's happening right now is all these banks are flush with cash and they gotta make some sort of interest or they gotta make some sort of money. So what they're doing is a lot of these banks buy portfolio or paper from other banks. So there are banks that hold paper, that build interest, and there are other banks that just basically process the loans, get them together, wait for six months, and then sell them off to other ones. And so what these banks are doing is, let's say you have a 15% loan, high interest loan. So these guys will package it up, sell it, and make you know maybe two, 3% on the loan, sell it to the next guy. The next bank will grab it because every quarter they gotta spend so much money because if they don't lend out whatever X of $100 million a quarter, they gotta go back and take less money the next quarter. So they're always trying to buy paper from each other. So they'll take this next paper, like well, we're just gonna make two, 3% and we'll just send it down the road to the next bank after a year. So they all keep trying to collect this two to 3%. So it's almost like musical chairs. The paper just keeps going around, but eventually when the music stops, when the economy drops, that's when somebody's gonna be left holding the bag. And that's when they can't sell the paper. The paper starts to default even higher. The rates go way up. Um, their, their portfolio value drops dramatically because now their depreciating asset dropped. And so when we talk about the 2008 housing market, people thought that, oh, it's because you know the housing like dropped, that's what really caused the, the headache and everything else. And I tell people, it's the reason why 20, uh, excuse me, 2008 was such a nightmare is when you have an asset that magically drops 30% and the banks are upside down in all their assets, it skews their books, they freak out, and what's the next thing they do? They stop lending, they pull the purse strings, they don't do anything, and then now lending is extremely tight, businesses are failing, 
they can't grow, so they start laying off people. Start people start laying off. They don't pay as much. Bank tightens up even more, and that reciprocating system keeps going down. So in 2028, everybody was upside down in their houses, but they had big down payments on their cars. You know, so everybody got rid of their houses, and the cars slowly trickled out as far as repo. That was our highest to date. I believe that 2023 and 2024 are gonna be the highest repo rates we've ever seen in our history. Because now, houses at least have a little bit of appreciation. People have equity in their homes. I think it was almost 90% of people have a majority of equity in their homes. But cars, when this market drops, it's gonna be just like the uh, 2008 housing market. People are gonna look and be like, why am I paying $1,000 a month for this Dodge Charger when I can buy the exact same car for 25 grand and my loan's 40? So they're just gonna go to the dealership, buy that car, and just walk away from their other one. It's gonna be like 2008 all over again, but this time it's gonna be with cars. Now, not only is some of this stuff um, basically very concerning, but the Fed, the government, everybody else has been writing about this. So the first article we're gonna go over is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So they have three main concerns. The first one is the outstanding debt is gonna be over it's right now currently $1.4 trillion. They believe by the end of 2022, it's gonna be 1.5 to 1.8 trillion, which is insane, like I said, which is the highest. Um, the next one is they're very concerned about LTV. During the pandemic, like we talked about, they lent so much money over value of vehicles. The, the, the vehicle values got skewed, everybody just went nuts, and now they're way upside down in their vehicles more than ever before. So the reason why this is a big deal now, and when we say the market bubble popped, and you guys haven't seen it in the, the retail sector, is because it takes a while for this information to come in, go through the banks, and they start changing policies, and that's what dictates the flow, demand, interest rates, everything else. And this is what they were seeing back in 2021. So they were seeing this last year and they were already concerned about it because when these LTV, when these loans start defaulting and then these people try to trade in these cars after they've drove them for a year or two and they want to get something else, they can't because they're so upside down in it. So this basically starts slowing down the car market. Um, and the next thing they're worried about is the high repo rate among prime borrowers. And that's what really scares me. Now we know the subprime market, these people, you know, with, with you know, job issues, credit issues, those are the first to basically either default, have issues, that's kind of our indicator of how the economy is going. But what scares me is when you see prime customers when their repo rates, they haven't quite doubled yet, they've, they've gone up a few percentage points, but that's what's scaring a lot of the banks. When you have somebody with a 700 credit score that's not really that on their bills, it's a homeowner, that's either voluntary giving their car back or just walking away from it because they don't want to pay this. Now, when we, a lot of these people got these loans back in 2020, which we talked about during the pandemic, during you know all this uh, excess of money. Well, fast forward to 2022, and you start to see that people's rent has doubled, people's utilities have doubled, grocery costs have skyrocketed 30%. So not only did they may have afforded it back then when there wasn't so much crazy inflation, but fast forward to today, they have to pay the rent. And like I said, some people's rents damn near doubled with rising gas prices, rising insurance prices. They maybe were allocated for a $1,000 monthly car payment, but now with these new prices, maybe they only allocated for a $500 car payment. So now they have no way to afford it. You know, if you think the average American is paying $2,000 a month in rent and they got to pay a $1,000 car payment, you know, they got $1,000 for groceries and $1,000 for miscellaneous. So unless these people are coming up with extra money doing side hustles, I don't see how this is going to go on. The ball has to stop bouncing. And I feel that basically we got another two months of like people kind of going on and doing stuff and, and buying cars as normal, but it's going to completely stop. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the mystique of this FOMO, this fear of missing out. One of the things that scares me a lot is I see these dealers really pushing this fear of you got to get this car or it's going to go up. The prices are going to go up. In these last three weeks, I've gotten calls from multiple dealers, not only here in Vegas, but in California, of offering me cars back of book, um, also cars that are uh, brand new that are back of MSRP, so I can get a Corvette right now at MSRP. Not over MSRP, at MSRP. Same thing with the Ford Lightning, a Bronco, you know, a few of these cars. And then a lot of people are walking away from their allocations because they see what's going on in the market. So Lamborghini of Las Vegas, I shout out to you guys. Um, 
I know that their lists shrink a little bit because a few of the people picked out. So we were looking at going over there and trying to buy a car. And now the list went from like, I think it was 20 months down to like 12 months now. So this is some of the stuff we're currently seeing in the market. Now, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is this chip shortage. I always hear these people, oh my God, lucky the chip shortage, the cars are not gonna return back to normal. And so what I did on a lot of my news interviews is I told them to do me a favor. If there's a chip shortage, I go, every cell phone, every PlayStation, a lot of these chip manufacturers make the same chips. You can go right now, buy a PlayStation, you can go right now, buy a cell phone, um, you can pretty much order whatever. And to really hit the point home, I told them, I was like, call up your local Chevy dealer, because um, they were on the East Coast. I was like, call up Chevy, tell them that you have a 2022 Chevy Corvette and you need a PCM. Guarantee you'll be within seven days. So they called up and they verified and they're like, yeah, they said it was seven days. I'm like, that's where your main chips are at. That's your processor. Like, there's not that big of a shortage. So the bottom line is you can get parts. We buy cars and fix them and send them to auction every single day. Now, during the pandemic, it was very hard to get parts. You know, we had to call, some stuff was on back order, but as of now, a lot of things are already moving. The only car we have problem getting parts for is Tesla because I'm just not a big fan of Tesla. The way they set up their system is awful. All the cars we fix are usually with used car parts because we can't get anything from them. Everything's always back order and they never know what's gonna to come uh, to pass. But everything else we can get. The only actual shortage that we can confirm is wiring harnesses for European vehicles because a lot of the BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Audi, uh, their main harness company was out of Ukraine. And as we know, unfortunately, what's going on over there. So their supplies are still going out, but they're a little backed up. It's gonna take you a month, two months sometimes to, to get some of the harnesses for some of the newer vehicles because of this actual shortage. But everything else, like I said, the cell phones you can go buy tomorrow, some of these game consoles you can buy tomorrow, your computers you can buy tomorrow, this camera that I'm on, everything runs off the same manufacturer's chip. I think it's, uh, it's a company from Taiwan, I can't remember, it's the biggest manufacturer uh, of uh, chips and semiconductors in the world. And so that's where we get a lot of our stuff from and they're operating at full capacity. I mean, I know they're under restrictions, but not as bad as what we think. But anyways, so my whole goal of this video is to share information. Now, it's okay if we don't see eye to eye, maybe you have a different opinion than me, but that's okay. I want you to put in the comment section below what you're currently seeing in your market because the last video we did opened up a lot of eyes. One thing that I noticed, a lot of people in the Northeast were really short on cars. And I noticed that some of the banks that I'm dealing with, they're taking the repos that they have here in Vegas and they're sending them to the Northeast because they can get more money because there's less cars there. So I wanna see what happens in the next few months when the Northeast fills up full of cars, like it is here on the West Coast, the Midwest, um, what the market's gonna do. Also, I'd like to hear from just regular people. What do you guys see in your market? Do you know a lot of people that maybe are losing their jobs, they're losing their cars? Do you know a lot of people that are taking their cars back and walking away from them because they don't want the headache or the financial responsibility? You know, like I said, put in the comment section below. Um, I'm gonna be doing some more videos. Like I said, I'm doing a 100K video because I just broke 100,000 subscribers. So I wanna make that one special, but I wanted to get this video out now because like I said, I have a bunch of new art uh, excuse me, news articles and everything else being written. And I'm gonna go on a few podcasts as well. So I just wanna get this one out here. But once again, I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. Please subscribe, also uh, smash the like button. And if you haven't already, follow me on Instagram at Lucky Lopez, and we'll see you next video.